Our Father and God, we thank you for today. Thank you for everyone who's here. Pray for those who are still on their way. And uh, pray for uh, your guidance today, Lord. Pray for you to teach us, uh, speak to us through your word, and equip us and help us to develop a biblical or Christian worldview. So, Lord, we need your guidance and uh, we need you. And may we celebrate you, particularly this time of the year. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, we are in a series that uh, I call being exclusivistic in a syncretistic world. Uh, And I'll explain that here in just a minute. And this is a study of Acts 17. So if you do have your Bibles or your phones or your tablets, go ahead and turn there. I will have some of the text up here. We did go over the text last time, but I want to reread it again. But just as a reminder to kind of give you a context of what's going on here, Paul is in Athens. We've been kind of tracing part of this second missionary journey that he's been going on. And he ends up in Athens, sees all the idols, and he starts to proclaim Christ and more. And, and that's what leads us into this part six series of, again, being exclusivistic in a syncretistic world. Today we'll be looking at the exclusive worldview, part two. Last time I looked at the exclusive worldview, part one, and we know that God is the foundation for any worldview. How, how we think of God and what we think of God determines how we look at the world. And that's actually what actual A.W. Tozer said. You know, your view of God is the most important thing about you. It tells you how you're going to think, what you're going to think about, how you're going to have, have a perspective on life. And we'll look at aspects of a worldview today. Again, we'll be studying verses 22 through 34. So again, we're finishing up the series right now. And I just want to give you a, a quick reminder uh, of a worldview here. Um, and these verses, of course, are a summary of what Paul said. His sermon on Mars Hill. Now, again, you can just read it in a few minutes. And if you know anything about Paul, he did not preach for just a few minutes. I mean, he was a very thorough individual <laughs> when he taught, too. And we're going to discuss this worldview now. A worldview is our view of the world and everything in it. It is how we view life, how we view problems and relationships and finances and politics and all this other stuff in life. And as we talked about last time, the basic example is a set of glasses, like a pair of glasses. You know, whatever color the glasses are, purple or blue or pink or red or orange, it colors everything that you see. And your worldview and my worldview colors everything that we see. And every human being in the world has a worldview. Whether it's good or bad, they have a worldview. So it's important for us to consider that whenever we're thinking about this because right now in our world, there is a battle of worldviews taking place. You know, we see it particularly in our country right now. It is hot and heavy going on, and we need to be aware of it, and we need to be involved. You know, this has been going on since Genesis 3 and the fall of mankind. Has God really said? Yes, he did. <laughs> and these verses not only tell us about God's character, as we saw last time, but also give a summary of how we as Christians should think of the topics we will discuss. Now, just as a reminder, during Paul's day, much like our world today, there was this mixture or everything becoming put together or syncretized. And again, we see it in our world today all, all the time. And last time, again, we studied the proper view of God's exclusive character, which is the foundation, again, of this Christian or biblical worldview. We saw that he's the creator, the sustainer, the savior, and the adjudicator or the judge. And Paul mentions that in the text. But in these same verses, Paul does give a basic overview or outline of a Christian worldview. And what is that? Well, we see creation, humanity, salvation, judgment, and resurrection. All aspects of a Christian worldview or parts of a worldview that everyone has, one perspective or another. Now, these are not the only things about a worldview, but these are kind of the, the, the skeleton on which you can hang the flesh of other parts of a worldview on. So that's what we're going to be looking at today for just a little bit. And I want you to really think about not just what we're looking at and what we're studying, but what is your perspective on these things too. So let's look at the verses. Acts 17, 22 through 34. And again, this is Paul in Athens. So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in all aspects. For while I was passing through your, and examining the Objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. 
The God who made the world and everything that is in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. That they, sh they would seek God if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he's not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and exist or have our being, as even some of your own poets have said. For we also are his descendants or offspring. Therefore, since we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought. So having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now proclaiming to mankind that all people everywhere are to do what? Repent. Repent. Because he has set a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to scoff. But others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out from among them, but some men joined him and believed, among whom also are Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So may the Lord bless his word today as we continue our study. So first, the first pillar of a worldview is creation. We have this in verses 22 through 25. Now when Paul arrives there, he knew what these individuals believed. He was a very intelligent guy. He understood the context and the culture in which he was serving. And he knew that the people were religious but did not believe in creation. And Paul confronted these philosophers with the truth. The Epicureans believed that matter or the physical was eternal. It always existed. Stoics believed that God was part of creation and also in some form was eternal. So they had no concept of any kind of starting point for creation. And by the way, both of these are evolutionary ideas. Remember cosmos? And Paul says, you know what? God made the world and everything in it being Lord of heaven and earth. So he establishes God as the creator here. And he says, you know, we are his creation and therefore, again, we are accountable to him. Paul talks about God, the one who made it all. Therefore, he is Lord of heaven and earth. He has authority over all of these things that you worship as God, if they worshiped those things at all. He says, everything is under his authority. Those things that you think are so important and eternal, they are not. They had a starting point. Now, this was controversial then, and this is still controversial today, believe it or not. The doctrine of creation is crucial for us to understand, and I believe the Bible is very, very clear on this. So we're going to spend just a few moments talking about creation itself. Now, I did go over some of these things in a... Uh, a different message I did some time ago on interpreting historical narrative in, in a series I did on interpretation of scripture. Uh, so this is gonna be a review for some of those who are here and it may be new for some, somebody else. But in Genesis 1, we have the declaration that God created all things in six days. Now some say, well, the days were a framework with God describing the function of the days being periods of time, etc. So the question is, were these days literally 24 hours each? Well, here's the thing. Let's consider this for just a few moments. When you look at the way it's used in the Bible, it's pretty clear. The Hebrew word is yom, Y-O-M, for day. Now, it can be used in different contexts. You have to look at the context, of course. But we have to ask, okay, well, it's used 2,301 times in the Old Testament, this word yom is. And it can have different meanings. Uh, it can mean longer than a day, day of the Lord. You know, it's longer than one day. But the only place that we question it is in Genesis 1. Why is that the case? We need to ask that question very seriously. And I'll go over some important things here in a little bit regarding creation and how we need to not compromise what Scripture says. Well, let's look at this for a moment. In Scripture, day plus a number is used 410 times. Evening and morning alone is used 38 times. Day plus evening and morning is used 23 times. Night and day is used 52 times. Without exception, every 
single one of these references equals a 24-hour period. So let's just think about Genesis 1, okay? Hmm, what do we have here? Well, we have night, evening, morning, number, first day, evening, morning, second day, number, evening, morning, third day, number, evening, morning, fourth day, evening, morning, fifth day, evening, morning, sixth day. Wow, so they're all in there. Hmm. Do you think God's trying to communicate something? <laughs> I think so. God is very clear. Now, I do want to stress this is not a salvation issue. There are Christians who deny us literal six-day creation that are Christians. But I do believe it is an authority issue. Because if we compromise here, sooner or later we're going to compromise somewhere else. And we need to be very, very careful. You know, because of fear of not being able to defend the truth historically, the church has compromised with an evolutionary model of millions and now even billions of years. But creation is the core, and this is where Paul starts with the creator and the creation itself, in contrast to evolution. Now, in our world today, there's basically two forms of evolution microevolution and macroevolution. Microevolution is the idea of a change within a species. We could call it adaptation. This occurs. This is where there's different kinds of dogs, you know, different skin tones in humans. How many of you have big dogs? Anybody have a big dog, like a golden retriever? Yeah, okay, yep. Yeah. How many have you little dogs? Like, you know, like a, yeah, little dogs. They're, guess what? They're both dogs. You know, it's, it's still a dog. Yeah, a dog is a dog. You know, cats too. We like taking Daniel to the zoo and animal, seeing animals and stuff, and he's like, the tiger's roar, you know. You know, a tiger is a big cat. But you don't take that tiger home and let it live in your house and sleep on your bed. There are other cats, house cats, that are like that. But they're all cats. You know, a cat's a cat. It may be different sizes and different shapes and different colors. One may be poofier than others, but it's still a cat. short hair cat, long hair cat, long hair dog, short hair dog. They're still the animals. There's still kinds. So those kinds of things do occur. It is true. But macroevolution, which is what is taught in schools and universities and even some so-called Christian schools, says there's a change from one species to another. A cat can become a dog or a bird can become a dinosaur or whatever. That's the idea of macroevolution. And that, of course, is a lie. Why is it a lie, though? Now, you may have some children or grandchildren or friends or family members who believe in evolution. Are you able to actually talk to them and say, it can occur, it can't happen? Here's just a few things where we know that evolution from one species to another cannot occur. One, something cannot come from nothing. The evolutionary model is based on the Big Bang, you know? There was this dot that exploded into everything, or nothing exploded into everything. It just doesn't make sense. It can occur. Something cannot come from nothing. It is logically impossible. It goes against the laws of science. Second, genetics makes macroevolution absolutely impossible. Our genetic code is so complex. If you ever study it, it is fascinating. It really is. The amount of information in genetics is staggering, and it all must be there at the same time. Likewise, and this is something I've never really heard discussed too much. Every human system must be in place and fully functional at the same time. You know, Dan Hayden could talk more about this too because you know, he has studied this a lot more than I have. But think about this. You can't have your circulatory system partially functioning with your digestive system just starting to develop. How are you going to survive? It doesn't work. You know, you can't have your brain just starting to develop. Oh, sometimes we wonder about some people, but it's another story. You know, while your heart is fully functioning, it just doesn't, doesn't work. You know, so all of the human systems have to be there functioning all at the same time for life to survive. But in, in an evolutionary model, how does that happen? Because one thing's got to do this. Well, that takes a lot of faith <laughs> to believe in that. Another one, the fossil record has zero transitional forms. Well, what about Lucy? Have you ever seen what Lucy actually is? 
It's a smattering of bones that they put together and they designed everything else around it. Look it up, look it up online. There's very few bones for a lot of the things that they use. Also too, and here's one of the big ones. God created Adam and Eve in his image, personally and with purpose. Evolutionary thought denies this completely. That's why so many people are wandering around trying to figure out, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Well, if you believe you're the product of slime, you have no reason to be here. There is no reason to be here. There's no purpose for your life. And is it any wonder why so many people are committing suicide? You know, no animal, no bug, no tree or rock was created in God's image. Only humanity was. This makes humanity unique, and evolution denies this. Ape to human? Really? So let me ask you this. If evolution is a lie, which it is, why do so many people believe it? Why do so many people embrace it? Any ideas? Any thoughts? They've not been taught about creation. They've not been taught about creation. Well, some have, maybe. And some have not accepted it. Some have not accepted it. What else? <laughs> yep, they watch popular media and network. No accountability. no accountability. What else? They don't want to believe in God. Yep, and that's why I didn't hear you. It's easy. It's easy. It's easy. Yeah, it's easy. It's easy. And all of you are correct, because what it boils down to is this: this is a worldview and spiritual issue. It is not an intellectual one. This is also a moral issue and not a scientific one. Because if I can say I'm the product of random chance, I can live my life the way I want to live. I can make the decisions I want to make. There is no accountability. I don't have to answer to God. I can treat people the way I want to treat them. I can use them the way I want to use them to get where I want to go because they're, they're just as useless as I am. So I can use people. And I can indulge my desires, my sinful desires, and live any way I want. And that's the world that we live in. Now, I want to talk just a few, for a few minutes now just about some implications of this as well as some other things. You know, so this is a big battle. This is why it's so important to understand that creation is one of the main pillars of a worldview that we should have. What is our view of creation? Where do we believe we came from? Now, yes, there are other views. There's the, the gap theory. There's the, the progressive creation and other things like that. And you can study those on your own time. But we've seen the consequences of compromise in the church for many generations now. And it's time that we step up and step back into what Scripture says. And lovingly yet boldly proclaim what it is, even if no one else wants us to. Even if no one else believes. Even if we get laughed at. Because creation is one of the core issues of a worldview that you have and that I have. And what I believe about creation, and of course God, because they're connected, is going to influence my view on other things, such as what we come to next. Humanity. Verses 26 through 28. Paul said from one man, of course we know that's Adam, that God made all humanity. Think about that for just a moment. Every human being on the face of this earth came from Adam and Eve. Wow. They've got a lot of kids. <laughs> but not only that, but God determined when and where they were going to live. God is separate from his creation, but he is near. He wants us to seek him, to find him. That's what Paul says here. It is in God or because of his mercy and grace that we can live, that we actually can breathe and blink our eyes and walk around. He is the author of life as the creator and we owe him our life. We cannot breathe apart from his power, apart from his grace, apart from his sovereign control. And he has authority over that and his universe. But Paul here speaks of the doctrine of mankind, humanity. He says, you know what? God provides for humanity's needs. Hmm. Now as we think about this, there is so much more than just God providing for us here in this text. Again, our view of humanity and life 
shapes how we view ethical issues and moral issues. Again, if you believe humanity is a product of chance and nothingness, your view of morality and ethics is going to be very different than if you know there's a God who created you personally and you're accountable to Him. Let's think about a few things. Again, origins. Adam and Eve were God's special, specific creation. Again, only we were created in His image. Yet today, we are actually in Adam's image, Genesis 5-9. We still retain part of that image of God, but it has been tainted, it has been uh, twisted by sin. But in Christ, we regain the image that was lost. Study Colossians 3, 9 and 10. That's what Paul's talking about there. Origins. Also too, when life starts. Another big issue for our world today. When does life really begin? Well, it begins at conception. When the egg is fertilized by the sperm. Begins with 46, cro or, uh, 46 chromosomes, 23 for the mother, 23 for the father. That's genetics right there. Science and the Bible very clearly indicate life begins at conception. This is a battle. You know, look at Psalm 139, 12 through 16. But then we think of Roe v. Wade and other things that have happened down through the years in America and other places too. And it's tragic to think how many multiple millions of lives have been murdered or have been sacrificed on the altar of self and money. So sad. Here's another one, another application. Bioethics. Your view of humanity is going to determine your view of bioethics, biological ethics, uh, stem cell research, cloning, where you use selective DNA to design babies that you want. Hmm. If life is in God's hands, then using stem cells from the unborn who will eventually be killed because of that is murder. Now there's some good stem cell research that doesn't involve that. But this makes abortion, euthanasia, uh, killing people because they're ill, because they're old, because they're just unwanted or they have some kind of supposed disease or you know, we just don't want you around. It makes all that sin. But what's being promoted in a lot of places around the world today? Just because it's legal doesn't make it right. Number four, marriage. God made one man and one woman, Genesis 1 and 2. Very clear in Scripture. For marriage, not two men, not two women, not three men and a baby, which is becoming more popular in our culture today. No, seriously. There's legal battles right now that some people have won where there's three guys and a baby involved. And they're considered a family. It's happening in our country right now. No other combination of marriage is a covenant, a sacred promise in God's eyes between a man and a woman. And we as a church need to really step up and recognize this again and understand how important this is. One more application for this is last. Sexuality and gender identity. This is a major, major topic. This is one of the most controversial topics in our world today. We now have Trans Day in America. Just this week. Declared. The biblical doctrine of humanity gives answers to the questions we have and people have about sexuality and gender identity. Male and female, we're one or the other. This means that transgenderism, homosexuality are sin. Leviticus 20, uh, 18, 22, 20 verse 13, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11 and more. Therefore, same-sex marriage is sin. Again, this is a big debate today. Gender identity, well, this man wants to become a woman so he can compete in sports. Why are we even having that conversation? Have you even, are we even asking those questions? Why? Hello, world. <laughs> but this is what occurs when you step away from a biblical world view. So don't be surprised when people talk about these things and come up with ideas like this. Another one is uh, gender transition. 
where they're encouraging children and youth and teens to take medication and get surgery, sometimes apart from their parents' consent or even knowledge. Now, more and more actually, you know, telling how horrible of a decision it was for them to do this. And you can find those stories online. It's tragic. But this is how confused people are in our world today. What is the answer? We need to go to them and help them, help them understand what a biblical worldview is of sexuality and gender. And help them through the, the emotional issues, the pain, the confusion that they have. And it takes time. So we have the doctrine of creation and now the doctrine of humanity. Next, verses 29 through 31, the doctrine of salvation. The doctrine of salvation. The living God created us and is not a false God of gold or silver or stone. And again, we are accountable to him. Paul says we're all God's offspring. Now, this does not mean everyone is saved. <laughs> That's universalism. That is heresy. It means that we're just his creation, his created beings. Because Paul is very, very clear. There is only one way of salvation that is only through faith in Jesus. And it's only those who put their faith in Christ alone for salvation that will go to heaven one day because they have their sins forgiven. This is having an exclusive view of salvation. And we need to have an exclusive view of salvation as professing Christians too. I showed you this early on. But again, we live in a syncretistic world where religions are coming together. Here's a couple of examples. Bumper stickers. And you may have seen these. Now, one time I saw a coexist sticker on the back of a car next to a Christian radio station sticker. There's something wrong there. Something wrong with that picture. But it's in the church too. It's in the church too. I mean, I was driving down the road and, and saw a uh, sign that was promoting Christian yoga. Doesn't exist. No such thing when you understand what really is going on with you, what yoga is. It's a contradiction. Now, this does not mean that we are cruel to people, that we make fun of them. It does not mean that uh, we bash their beliefs or, or, or convictions or anything like that. But we have to recognize that in every religion in the world, people think that they can be saved by their works, by what they do, by prayers they pray, by things they do, by giving, by this, by that. That's an offense to God. God has provided one way, and that is by grace through faith in the finished work of Christ. Not on what you can do, not on what I can do. Biblical Christianity says we are saved by grace through faith in His Son, who died for our sins on the cross and physically arose again on the third day. In the same body, by the way, too. According to the Scriptures. Also, too, Jesus Himself says He's the only way. John 14, 6. So when you look at what Christianity is, it is unique among the world's religions and the philosophies and the cults. Again, I'm reemphasizing it is by God's grace through faith, not as a result of works. So this is another pillar of a biblical or Christian worldview. And without understanding what salvation really is, we're not only compromising Scripture, but we are misleading people by saying they can find forgiveness outside of Christ. And that is a horrible, horrible, horrible offense to God. So, what do we believe about salvation? Do we believe we can work to achieve our salvation or work to keep our salvation? That's legalism. Well, I may be saved by grace, but I've got to do this and this and this and this and this to be on God's good side. <clears throat> Wrong answer. You've stepped away from grace. Now, grace doesn't mean we don't have responsibilities because we do. Doesn't mean we don't follow what God says because we do. But we recognize that it's a gift, and we thank him for it. Next, verses 29 through 31, judgment. Judgment. Paul's very clear here. What does he say? Well, Paul says there will be a day when God will judge. He doesn't beat around the bush. He doesn't mince any words. Because God is the creator, because we are his creation, we are accountable to him for what we think and what we say and what we do. And also, too, we're accountable for what we don't say and don't do when we should have done it or should have said it. 
And Paul says, you know what? He's going to judge the world one day through a man, through Jesus Christ. Now, the Stoics and Epicureans denied the eternal place of torment. Hmm. But God says, or Paul says, you know, God is going to judge. God has the authority to do so, and he's given that authority to Jesus. And this is what Jesus himself said in John 5. 22 and 23 and 27. For not, even, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son just as they honor the Father. The one who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Jesus' own words. The Father gave authority to the Son to judge. And that's exactly what Paul says here in Acts 17. When Christ returns, he will judge the world during the day of the Lord. There was no sin, no error, no shadow in him. He is set apart from all that defiles. He is completely pure, and because of this, in his righteousness and in his holiness, God must judge sin. And in his holy love, he must judge sin. Why? Because it is the right and just thing to do. The ultimate judgment will be in the lake of fire. Hell or Hades, which is a place of the dead which involves torment and fire, is temporary. And it too will be cast into the lake of fire one day. Revelation 20, 14 and 15 say that. God's judgment is real. It is eternal. It is also personal. There is no annihilation. There is no soul sleep or anything like that. And we need to recognize this. We need to understand, you know, what does Scripture say about hell? Now, there were various things in the Old and New Testament, and there was a particular view that the Jews did have of the afterlife, which we see in the New Testament, and it's expanded upon. One of those ideas, what is known as, is pictured in the word Gehenna. And this was in the Hinnom Valley. Now, for those who've been to Jerusalem, you've been through here, you've seen this. This is an area where the Hinnom Valley is, and you can still, of course, see it today. And this is one of the three references in the New Testament to the word we use as hell, but it's the Greek word Gehenna. And historically, this was a place of idolatry. This is where people took their kids to sacrifice to the pagan gods. In the days of Israel, it was Israel's garbage dump, constantly smoldering and smoking and stinking and everything where the flame does not die. Here's another picture. But here you see a picture of where the Hinnom Valley is, and you can see it right down here. Here's Zion. Here, of course, is the Dome of the Rock up here where the temple would have been. Hinnom Valley was right there. And I imagine it was probably further away from <laughs> the, the town where they were doing the, uh, the burning and everything with the, the, because of the smell. But we see very clear things in Scripture why this was used as a picture of hell, a picture of fire and judgment. Here's a few things. Hell, or even the lake of fire, is, is pictured as eternal fire, Matthew 18, 8 and 25, 41, where the fire is not quenched, Mark 9, 48. It's a place of worms, Mark 9, 43 through 48. Outer darkness, Matthew 8, 12 and 22, 13. A place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, Matthew 24, 51, 25, 30. But we also learn that there's degrees of punishment, Mark 6, 11, Luke 10, 12 through 14. Everlasting punishment, Matthew 25, 46. Torment with fire and sulfur with no rest day or night. Wow. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. So there's a, judgment is real and Paul is not shirking his responsibility to warn these individuals about God's coming judgment. And we need to recognize too that the lake of fire is a literal place where individuals who do not know Christ will spend eternity. They will suffer God's wrath. Now, I've heard it said, you know, hell is the absence of God's presence. No, it's not. Hell and the lake of fire is not the absence of God, but the presence of God in his full wrath on those who have rejected Jesus. Don't forget, Jesus spoke of hell more than heaven. And think about this, as you can see the statistics here, about 20 to 35% of Protestants don't believe that hell exists. They don't believe it's a real place of torment where people will suffer temporarily but then eternally in the lake of fire. 
Judgment is real, and that has to be one of the pillars that we understand of a Christian worldview. And that's why we rejoice in the grace of God and the salvation of Christ. Last, resurrection, verses 18 and 29 through 34. Now, before I get into this real quick, I just want to elaborate just for a moment on uh, the doctrine of judgment because it is controversial today. Let me go back one here. There are pastors and writers and preachers and teachers and worship leaders who will deny that hell exists. They say God is too loving to send someone to hell. And maybe, everybody heard of that? And maybe your friends, family have said that? Yeah, people say that. People think that. Well, that's a really diminished view of love, a diminished view of God's holiness, and a really confused view of how you define love too. We don't believe in hell because we don't understand the holiness of God. We don't understand the depravity of our sin. And we don't understand what love really is. Think about this. God is eternal. One sin against an eternal God is an eternal offense to him. Therefore, he must judge eternally. If there's no lake of fire, then God is unjust. What would you think if there was a judge in a courtroom and before him was standing a rapist who had murdered 50 women as well? And he looked at that man and said, not guilty. There would and should be an uproar and an outcry against this judge and against what happened. Why? Because that is unjust. Now think about this. God, the eternal judge, which every sin is against him, he can't just say, okay, not guilty. That would be unjust. That would be unloving. That would be wrong. A just human judge must judge sin temporarily, and a just eternal judge must judge sin for eternity or eternally. And by the way, if purgatory is real, God is also unjust and a liar. Purgatory is, quote, to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. That's the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1030. That is not what the Bible says. Rather than recognizing the complete, perfect, and once for all sacrifice and the atoning work of Christ, there are some who say, Catholic, which is what Catholic theology says, that the death and resurrection of Jesus is not enough. And that is an offense to God. Next, now we get to resurrection. Here Paul speaks specifically of the resurrection of Christ. He turns to that. The one whom God has appointed, the God-man who gave proof that God will judge through him, how? By raising him from the dead. Now, some mocked, some wanted to know more, but this also was a foreign concept to them. They did not believe in any kind of physical resurrection from the dead. But there were some who did believe, like uh, Dionysius the Areopagite. And Eusebius, one of the early church fathers, says that this man became the first bishop in Athens. Now, I do want to talk about the resurrection for just a moment and the resurrected body of Jesus. You know, what was it? What was it like? And you know, we talk about it at Easter all the time, but what was it really like? You know, believing in the resurrection, again, is also one pillar to a biblical worldview because we're going to come back to life one day. You know, the body that you have is going to... Oh, 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 oh. It's going to get better one day. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. This tells us there, there, there is life after death. It's not just in a place, but it's with a person. In Luke 24, we read about Jesus being crucified and buried and three days later again raising from the dead on the first day of the week. He appeared to many on Emmaus walking, the, two, the, the, the couple there on, you know, walking, talking, teaching. He sat with them, broke bread, and then they realized it was Jesus and then poof, he disappeared. But then something happened in Luke 24. Now, while they, the two on the road to Emmaus, were telling these things to the other disciples and apostles, Jesus himself suddenly stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Shalom. But they were startled and frightened and thought they were looking at a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you frightened? And why are doubts arising in your hearts? See my hands and my feet? 
It is I myself. Touch me and see, because a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you plainly see I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they still could not believe it, because of their joy and astonishment, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They served him a piece of broiled fish. He took it and ate it in front of them. Wow. Great verses, by the way, to talk to a Jehovah's Witness about the physical resurrected body of Jesus, because they deny that. So what can we learn from this passage about his resurrected body and our future resurrected, glorified body? Just got five things, real quick. First of all, Jesus had a physical body. He was not a spirit. Second, he spoke with them. He talked to them. This was not a hallucination. Number three, he ate fish. Doesn't mean he was hungry, but it proves that he had a physical body. Number four, he miraculously appeared in front of them. Now, I've heard people say, well, he walked through a wall. It doesn't, doesn't say that. The text doesn't say that. It says he appeared. Number five, the body that died is the same body that came back to life in a glorified way. There is that connection there. It's a supernatural body. So as we look at these things specifically here, we don't study this just to know what the text says, although that is important, or learn you know, a place to go when we're witnessing somebody, although that is important too. But we see what our bodies are gonna be like one day. I think I'll go to Mars today, poof. That'd be cool. <laughs> I wonder what's going on over in well, Asia, poof. Whoa, that'd be cool. We will be physical, we will be supernatural. We can eat and speak and appear, disappear at will. Now we also recognize both the Christian and non-Christian will have resurrected bodies. Scripture does talk about that too. However, the resurrected bodies that the non-Christians will have will be in a permanent place called the lake of fire. And they will not be able to leave. So how does all this fit into our worldview? Well, it answers the questions that we have. Because it's vital that we develop an exclusive biblical worldview based upon what the text says of the Bible, based upon God's word, because in a syncretistic world we must stand for truth, and only biblical Christianity can answer the questions of life that people are asking, whether verbally or just in their own minds. Here they are. Where did I come from? Where did I come from? Origins. We talked about origins. God's the creator. We're his creation. Why am I here? Purpose. Again, if you do any kind of work with youth, this is one of the most important aspects of youth ministry. Where am I going? That's eternity. Is there a heaven? Is there a hell? Is there nirvana? Do I just cease to exist? What happens? Number four, why are things the way they are? Why is everything so messed up in our world today? Why are there viruses? Why are people dying? Why is there cancer? Why are there accidents? Why are their governments so corrupt? Why? This is reality, and of course it's all because of sin. And biblical Christianity explains where sin came from. And number five, does God exist? And if so, does this God care? And can I know this God? Theology. So all these questions, and there are more, are foundational to having a biblical or Christian worldview. No other worldview or religion or philosophy can truly answer these apart from biblical Christianity. Now we've looked at where we came from. We're a personal creation of God. This answer is, why am I here? Well, I'm here to know him, to love him, to worship him, and to serve him, and to tell others about him. Where are you going? Well, there's only heaven or hell. There's no other option. And understanding the doctrines of creation and judgment tells us why things are the way they are. Why is that? Because of sin. Go back to Genesis 3. And yes, there is a holy God, and he cares Purpose and meaning are only found when we know where we came from in the past as a special creation of God, know to whom we belong in the present, God or Satan, and where we are going in the future, heaven or hell. 
That's how you find your purpose. So how do you answer these questions? How are you developing a biblical or Christian worldview? So as we finish up today, Paul was in Athens. He preached to the philosophers. He proclaimed the character of God, his work in history, and gave an overview of an exclusive biblical worldview. Fascinating, huh? Now there is more, but again, these five things, creation, humanity, salvation, judgment and resurrection, are foundational pillars of a Christian worldview. So as you continue to build this important worldview and apply these truths to ethics and decisions and more, you will learn how to live the Christian life. You may think, well, what does it mean for me right now? Well, you need to know these things. You need to ask these questions to yourself. Do I have a biblical worldview about creation, about humanity, about salvation, about judgment, about resurrection, about ethics, about this and about that? You also need to know to help your kids, to help new believers. If you're discipling somebody, you need to understand these things. Also with your friends and with the lost, for evangelism, for life. And to be able to deal with the questions that will come into your path by people. These truths do impact you and me. We must ask, if we have a biblical or excusive worldview about what we discussed today, discussed today, but also about life, work, finances, problems, relationships, marriage, culture, sexuality, race, genetics, and more. So are we developing an exclusive Christian or biblical worldview in our lives? If not, I exhort you and challenge you to do so. Using Paul's example of his message to these philosophers in Athens. Do it based upon scripture, because if not, we may be in danger of developing a syncretistic worldview based upon what the world says. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we again thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace and your love. And thank you, Lord, that we can have a biblical worldview and that you exhort us to have one, to think according to your word. We have the mind of Christ. Help us to think accordingly, Lord. So, Lord, may you speak to us, maybe in one area or another, where we may not know what we believe. We may not be aware of what your word says about a topic or a specific subject that we haven't studied. So, Lord, I pray that these five things that we've discussed today are, are a good springboard for other studies. So, Lord, may you change us and may you make us more like Christ because that's what it's all about. Conform us to his image. For your glory we ask in his name. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.